Okay, guys, so now we are going to be talking about botulism. Botulism is also a neurologic type of disease, and the bacteria is the cousin of the tetanus bacteria. So this one is called, but is called Clostridium botulinum. So it's another Clostridium type of disease. And one other thing that you guys need to know is that Clostridium diseases are deadly, okay? So um, they are anaerobic, they are everywhere, and they actually kill, okay? By different ways, but they actually kill. So like Clostridium difficile and perfringens, they cause uh, diarrhea. Uh, Clostridium perfringens causes a disease in cattle that ca um, causes them to bloat and they die like sudden death. It's very uh, it's a deadly type of bacteria. So let me share the screen with the botulism, which is the same PowerPoint that I posted for you guys called tetanus and botulism. But I just try to break up these two lectures into two because it's different subjects. So here we go. So again, it's caused by the exotoxin of Clostridium botulinum, okay? And as opposed to tetanus that is uh, characterized by rigid paralysis botulism is characterized by flaccid paralysis so instead of the animal contracting all the muscles at the same time the animal in this case cannot contract the muscles whatsoever so it it's just flabby and flaccid flabby not cannot contract okay Paralysis. So the way that the horse dies is similar because it's also respiratory failure, but in the case of botulism is because the diaphragm and the other respiratory muscles cannot contract. All that they're doing is becoming flaccid, okay? One thing that is important and interesting for you guys to see is that, come back, is that the botulinum toxin is the most potent toxin known to mankind, okay? The most potent toxin known to mankind. What does that mean? What does potency mean? Something that is potent means that a small amount can cause full effect. Something that is weak, it means you need something more to cause full effect. Just as an example, something that we understand. For you to be fully alcoholized on beer that is light beer you need to drink 10 beers as opposed to drinking only three shots of a hundred proof vodka because one has more alcohol content so it's stronger more potent as opposed to the other one that's weaker okay so this is important for us to understand now one time uh in the same class a million years ago a student said i don't understand what this means that just a small dose can uh, cause the death okay it's because very potent and a small dose can cause the death of the individual and she's and i said i don't understand what you mean and she said how about uranium and my response to that is that uranium is not a toxin okay a toxin by definition is something that is created by a living organism in this case it's a bacteria uranium is a type of atomic bomb it's a metal that is that is cut the atomic the atom is cut and produces this huge power that kills people i understand the atomic bomb is very lethal and deadly this is not a toxin this is a metal and that's the difference that i well, i hope you guys remember this from seventh grade chemistry because this is now college so anyway this is something that i always have to say because it just kills me um Again, it's gram positive and anaerobic, just like all Clostridium type of bacteria. Uh, in the case of botulism, it has eight neurotoxins. Am I gonna ask the different ones? I am not going to. They all cause, remember tetanus has two neurotoxins. One is the tetanolysin, the other is a tetanospasm. Uh, in the botulism, all the toxins cause the exact same uh, clinical signs. The difference is that in different states, we have one or more toxins that are more prevalent. And in Kentucky, we have more of the type B. And the other thing too is that the tetanus vaccine is going to protect against all tetanus toxins, whereas the botulism vaccine is the only one that we have available is protective against type B only. 
our luck is that 80% of the cases of botulism are caused by the type B toxin. And this is the only vaccine that we have. Again, it's infectious, but not contagious. It is reported worldwide, but is very much seen in the United States. Okay, in Kentucky, we brewed the type B uh, type of toxin. Uh, there was a study done multiple years ago in that a group of people went and collected uh, samples of soil across the United States and every place that they collected in Kentucky, as you guys can see, um, had was positive for the type B. And then the type A was more uh, in the west part of the country and type C is generally caused by the feces of um, animals. Uh, so it's something that we need to be thinking about also. Uh, type B is generally caused uh, by spoiled hay, grass, or feed, okay? So this is the type that we have a lot in Kentucky. And the way that the animals get this disease is, for example, here there is a lot of rain all the time, and the rain creates this muddy area, and the animals just stomp on this, you know, hay or whatever it is that you throw outside for the horses to eat. And especially, for example, say a round bale of hay. You put the round bale outside, how long does it take for two horses to eat a whole round bale? Let's say a week, okay? In a week, they're going to eat more or less 30% of it and rain and they're gonna step on it and they're gonna stomp on it or they're going to defecate on it and urinate on it and they're going to waste all this hay. The problem is this, people see this hay that still is outside and especially say in Kentucky where it rains every single day um, and uh, uh, these animals are outside because it's not very cold. Uh, so people see this hay outside, they think there is still hay because they are visually seeing this hay, but the problem is this hay is already now contaminated because this animal stomped and stepped on it, mixed it with the wet, nasty, anaerobic soil, okay? And the problem is now the animals, if they're not thrown in fresh hay, they are now going to eat this spoiled hay that is full of the toxins. And this is where the problem is because given the chance, the horses will eat the fresh hay that is not spoiled. So this hay that has been stomped on and got integrated with the soil and now gets pulled out is that black um, moldy type of hay, which is different from the hay that is put up before it had enough time to dry. And now we have the mold that's another type of hay that we open the flakes of hay and that white dust just comes out as mold. That's another type of mold. And that is going to cause what respiratory disease that you guys, I hope you guys remember, but it's heaves and uh, inflammatory other types of disease. So that dust mold, that's the white type that comes up, causes that respiratory disease. The mold that's black because it got integrated with the soil and became moldy and spoiled. Botulism thrives in that kind of uh, environment. And then one little blade of grass because it is the most potent toxin. So just a very small amount can lead to death. Uh, so that becomes uh, the problem in areas such as, you know, Kentucky when you feed round bales. Uh, the other thing too is areas that get flooded. So the flood, so that creates an anaerobic part. And then when the water recedes in that area that got receded the water, when animals sometimes eat that particular grass, they also can be contaminated with uh, botulism. And um, the other thing too that happens in areas where people feed haylage or silage. So silage, as you guys know, and haylage is a way to... Um, ferment uh, and to store this hay that is in an anaerobic way uh, to keep this from getting spoiled. So this is a way that cattle can eat that. But the problem with silage, for example, you just, you know, you, I don't know, you harvest corn, uh, you chop it up and then you add nitrogen and you put under a tarp for 45 days and then you start to feed that to cattle. 
because cattle, as opposed to horse, can uh, produce, can transform uh, and make protein out of non-proteic nitrogen. So they get the urea that you added to the silage, which is full of nitrogen, and make that into protein, and they can grow and become fat like that. Horses cannot do that. Uh, but the problem is once you open the silage, you have to use it in a certain amount of time because once it's open and in contact with air, it can get spoiled really quickly. The other problem with silage or even haylage, haylage is it's when you collect the hay and you wrap it in plastic before it's fully dry so you can store it for later. The problem with these is that if it's not stored correctly or if the pH is not below, I think it's 3.6, in a way that it can actually kill this bacteria. It is a perfect environment for uh, anaerobic bacteria such as botulism. And there was a case in, um, in remember I said that this particular bacteria is infectious but not contagious. So if one horse has, it doesn't mean that the other horse is going to have. And that is important too, because in the case of botulism, even though it's not contagious, but if multiple horses are eating the same source of contaminated food, they can have, they can all die at the same time in the period of about 12 to 24 hours. In Florida, several years ago, this group of recipient mares, so they're just mares that would uh, receive embryos for other mares, uh, they all were fed silage and they died, 107 mares, I think, all died within 24 hours <clears throat> because the silage was contaminated. And when they start to eat, one fell over that, the next fell over that. And botulism is so fast because it's so potent that uh, it's the case that you see the horse in the evening. Oh, the horse was fine. There was no clinical signs for any disease. And then he's dead the next morning. So within 12 hours, this horse just simply dies. Okay. So uh, this is important too, because um, people, um, so this was in 2008 in Florida, that the recipient mares died uh, because people are like this horse was not sick yeah and that's the problem with botulism uh, the type c of botulism because it comes from the feces of animals it is generally found um especially in round bale hay because as you roll the hay and as you harvest the hay and roll the hay uh and then you just put these big bales for the horses they just eat you don't break it into uh, flakes to just feed to the horse, in which case, if there is a dead animal inside that square bale, you can, as you break into flakes, you can see. In round bales, because you don't generally, so you just put the hay out and the horses will eat it. If there is a dead animal, it can be rodents, such as rabbits, it can be snakes, it can be turtles, it can be a bunch of things. When they get rolled in and they get stored, the, con the GI tract contents just leach out to the hay, and this is a big bale, so very anaerobic, and that's when the botulism uh, bacteria start to create spores and release toxins because of that uh, environment. Okay, so let me share here the screen again so we can see. So again, am I saying that round bales are bad? Round bales can be bad if they're not treated with respect. So they need to be stored correct. They cannot be left outside. So rain uh, and all sorts of elements, uh, weather elements can just you know, get to them. They also, ideally, there is no dead animals in them, okay? There's three ways that the pathogenesis of this disease can happen. One is uh, the forage poisoning, which is ingestion of preformed toxins in contaminated feed, we are, which we already talked about this. Uh, this generally happens um, in the decaying grass and hay or grain. Uh, this is generally the forage poisoning. The toxico infectious is you ingest the spores and these toxins are formed in the GI tract. And this generally happens in foals because they're not, their immune system is not strong enough to just get rid of these toxins because horses, this happens to adult horses also, but it's not a problem. But in foals, they have this disease that's called the Shaker foal syndrome, which was first described here in Kentucky in the 70s in that they would see these foals get up to nurse the mares and they would start to nurse and they would start to shake and collapse and fall over 
and collapse. And there is a lot of froth in their mouth because they weren't being able to swallow all this milk that they were nursing. So this has was called the shaker fall syndrome, which was later uh, described as being botulism. But the way that this was being formed is the horse, because it's part of the uh, it is part of the environment that the animals live. These foals were just regular grazing uh, beside the mares and they would just form the spore, the toxins in their GI tract. And then just like tetanus, we can have botulism being formed because of contaminated wound, because again, it is uh, an anaerobic bacteria. So it could happen in castration wounds, etc. okay? The pathogenesis, this toxin irreversibly binds to cholinergic nerve terminals. Remember I talked about acetylcholine and how it is uh, a mediator that uh, is going to bind to receptors to trigger the basal, remember living and all that. So the acetylcholine is going to bind to muscles, to the receptors in muscles to make them contract. So in this case, because this toxin binds irreversibly, to the cholinergic nerve terminals, acetylcholine is not able to bind to these muscles. Therefore, these muscles cannot contract. And that's why we have the clinical signs of flaccid paralysis, because there is paralysis, but uh, there is no contraction. They're flaccid, they're flabby types of paralysis, which I said leads to the same type of death, which is um, respiratory failure. The clinical signs of botulism is going to be dysphagia. Dysphagia means difficulty in eating, difficulty in swallowing. And one of the diagnostic tools that we have is we put half of a cup of grain in a horse's tub, feed tub, and then generally a healthy horse, a half of a cup, meaning literally half of a cup, not just half of a scoop, it's half of a cup. And it takes generally a horse to bites to eat the whole thing in a horse with botulism after like two three four five minutes they are not able to ingest that amount of feed and there's a lot of saliva now mix and slobber because they are not also able to swallow their saliva there's paralysis and they just can't swallow and there is that uh very flaccid tongue that this just hangs outside so there's a lot of drooling happening and the horse cannot there's this phase the horse cannot eat the half cup of feed. Decreased eyelid, tongue, and tail tone. So remember in tetanus, the tail was very much contracted. In botulism, you just pick up the tail and just falls over again because there is no tail tone. Tongue, the tongue is flaccid and there is no tone. It's just hanging outside. The eyelid uh, is just like the horse is, has difficulty maintaining. He's like he has this sleepy look to his face. The onset of disease may happen very, very suddenly uh, within very few hours after the horse has ingested the toxins and the horse can die as quickly, okay? Sudden or unexplained death of one or more horses, there's gonna be muscle trembling and foals recumbency, so the horse is gonna be laying down. Diminished GI motility, so the horse can also show signs of colic and discomfort, and death is going to be because of respiratory failures. The diagnosis, because it's a very potent toxin, there is very few times that you can actually collect blood and find a toxin. Even upon necropsy, even if you uh, test all the GI contents, it's very difficult to actually find a toxin. So that, that diagnosis for botulism is the clinical signs and the history, such as was the horse being fed round bales? Was the round bale fresh or was it out there, you know, to uh, fight, you know, in the weather where there's rain, the horse is stomped on it, etc. cetera. Um, silage, was this horse eating silage? So this is all things that go into the diagnosis because it's hard because you, you can try to, to see if there is still hay left over, you can go to the property and see what kind of hay we're talking about. But uh, some, most of the times so animals have already consumed the food, okay? Let me see how I can do this. Oh, video is unavailable. Hold on just one second. Let me find the videos. Okay, so let me share the screens with you, the video. So we are going to have 
Hold on. So this is a horse with botulism here. You can see he's very weak, weak legs. You can see he's shaking. It's very hard for him to stay standing. He's weak. He is having a hard time. Uh, and obviously he's nervous because he's having to be in a hospital. Uh, but this is just, um, you know, a way the botulism. So this type of horse, if they get to the hospital early enough, they may be able to be uh, saved, okay? But it's very seldom that you can actually save a horse uh, with botulism. So this is another one. You can see dysphagia, okay? So he's trying to eat, as you guys can see, and he is not, you see there's some food in his mouth, and he's not totally being able to swallow. He's like, ah, having a hard time eating. And you guys are gonna see very like flaccid eyelids, okay? Hold on. Dead horse, dead horse, dead horse, okay? And you guys are going to, this horse is eating from round bales and obviously the round bale was contaminated. As you guys can see, this is not a very clean area that they're just like feeding these horses, okay? So this is important to look at him. He's trying to chew, he's trying to swallow. So he already is contaminated. He's already infected with the disease. It's, but this is just showing signs of this face. He's trying to chew, he's hungry. He's trying to swallow, but he is, look at this, all this hardware. So the horse was about to die somehow, if not by eating bad hay, but by getting paled. Okay, so this is um, clinical signs of botulism. Stop share. Let me now go back to the what to the PowerPoint okay how do we treat this horse is again this because it irreversibly binds it takes two to three to four weeks depending on uh, the horse for the nerve terminals to be remade new and you need to keep this horse on ventilators uh, for that long and again we don't have ventilators that can ventilate an adult horse for that long period of time so generally for shaker foal syndromes, we can keep them on ventilators for two to three weeks until they get better uh, and new nerve terminals are grown. But for adult horses, there isn't much that can be done. So treatment is going to be antitoxin administration. Uh, there is anti-B and anti-C. They are made in Pennsylvania. They're much more expensive than, for example, the tetanus antitoxin. Nursing care. So fluids, uh, this horse is going to be needed, you know, it's uh, bladder empty, the GI tract empty, this just is gonna be needed to be kept on slings. It's just an expensive disease. Again, respira uh, respiration assistance, generally just to foals. Uh, already talked about this, already talked about this. So this is just photos of foals on respirators, okay? Mare gets, obviously, uh, admitted to the hospital with their foes uh, and uh, it just takes a long time and it's an expensive disease to treat so um, the way that you deal with these horses and the management of the farm is more important in these cases and again because if you are in Kentucky not just broodmares broodmares here are very much vaccinated for botulism type B because of the shaker foal syndrome and the amount of foes we raise in Kentucky every year but it's important that even if you're not having broodmares. If you have regular horses, show horses, uh, pasture pets, it doesn't matter. In Kentucky, it is very much advisable to vaccinate for type B botulism, which again is the only vaccine that we have. Um, and it costs about maybe $25 per vaccine for those. It starts with a three dose regimen and then it's an annual um, booster. Okay, so it's very, very much important to vaccinate for this if you are in Kentucky. And avoid feeding round bales to horses, especially if you're gonna feed in a way that you're not gonna be paying attention to what these horses are eating. Uh, if, like I said, some people that just throw in the round bale and hope for the best, this is not the way to do it. And avoid feeding silage or haylage to the horses. And this again is just showing a photo of how horses, because a lot of every, a lot of places in the country, in the world, feed round bales and they may not have uh, a high incidence of botulism. 
And it may be because, uh, you know, the type of the soils that they have, like remember, if you guys remember the, the soils that were tested in Kentucky, we have a lot of that. Now in Europe, they feed a lot of silage because they don't have a lot of space to, to make hay the way that we do here. So when they feed a lot of silage or haylage to these horses, sometimes they lose horses for botulism. It's just not as well reported as we report here. And um, sometimes when they cut open the plastic for the haylage, they see that it's black and molded. They need to obviously get rid of that hay and off feed to the horses. So again, Clostridium type of diseases are deadly, anaerobic, and the diagnosis is a lot of the times by the clinical signs because they are potent type of diseases. Uh, tetanus, because um, the combo vaccines, all of, a lot of them have tetanus included in it. Uh, it is possible that every once in a while, even if this is an unknown vaccination history that this horse has received tetanus in the past, Botulism, a little bit more complicated because not all veterinarians vaccinate for it. There's only one company that makes a vaccine for this called Neogen, and uh, it's only for type B. So that does not prevent the type of botulism that you have for dead carcasses round up in, uh, enrolled in the bale. So if you guys have any questions, once again, don't hesitate. Just send me an email or join me tomorrow uh, at, on Friday, I mean, uh, at 10 a.m. Thank you.